really excited that you're here joining us today. Um, it's no secret, the nonprofit sector is changing, leadership is changing, and we have two gentlemen here today, and this is going to throw me for a loop because you're both named John. We have John Tisa, Director of Client Services of JMT Consulting, and Dr. John Davidoff, Founder and Chief Mission Officer of Davidoff Mission Driven Business Strategy. Both of these gentlemen are going to have a really robust conversation with us about developing nonprofit professionals. And it's really investing in future leadership. And, and so we are super excited to have them here. Again, we've been rolling out a new cohort of co-hosts for the nonprofit show. And you're going to be even meeting more of them over the next couple of weeks. And we're really, really excited to have some new national and different perspectives um, joining us daily. We also have amazing gratitude for our corporate sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. John Tiso, you join, you're joining us, Director of Client Services, JMT Consulting, Talk to me a little bit about what JMT does and, and how you've come to be interested in the leadership piece of this. All right, well, thank you very much. So JMT is a uh, software and consulting services firm that is focused exclusively on nonprofit organizations and is supporting and assisting them with any of their back office needs or system or program needs, staff development, accounting services, et cetera. We, we do a lot, we try to be a one-stop shop for everybody that works at any nonprofit organization. And my, my initial introduction to leadership started off in the, we'll say the classic perspective of it being around title and role and authority. And then I actually had met Dr. John here when he came and presented for my whole company at, at our annual client conference, Innovate. And, you know, just to keep it short, uh, he was himself in a way that allowed me to challenge my assumptions or beliefs about leadership. Mm -hmm. And we initiated a relationship and he has for upwards of six years now uh, personally supported and nurtured my continued development and growth. Okay, Dr. John Davidoff, you know, this is a unique situation that you're in because a lot of times, well, I can th think maybe a half a dozen times, somebody's come on and been able to witness about a guest and what the, how they've impact that, impacted them. So talk to us about what you do because this is pretty powerful. Well, thanks. And thank, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, so uh, I'm the founder and chief mission driver at David Off Strategy. And uh, what our firm does is help nonprofit organizations become authentically mission driven. Mm. And uh, my partners and I have spent, um, uh, we're in our 20th year. So uh, we, we've spent 20 years researching both academic theory and concepts, but real life experiences, what, what actually does it mean to be authentically mission driven as a nonprofit organization? And what we've found out is it means having a comprehensive strategic plan, which is a plan that has critical thinking, has identified what is the situation this plan is responding to, has paradigm shifts built into a whole bunch of things you don't find in the normal strategic plan. Authentic mission-driven organizations also have continuous leadership development as a value. So they value that everyone is learning and growing from the CEO, executive director throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. And then the third one, and I think I'm gonna get a smile from you on this, is uh, they strive to have a drama-free, Mm -hmm. higher functioning culture. Thank you. That should be number one, Dr. John. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I think a lot of folks believe that or talk about it, but they don't actually embed that in their systems. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing that up because let's face it, for most of us, we are working in trauma. We are working in tough drama laden environments and so it kind of it's easy to 
absorb that and, and keep that going. Let's kind of drill down a little bit and talk about the multi multiple areas of an effective nonprofit leader. Um, it seems to me a lot of times we think, oh, if, if somebody is coming from arts and culture, they got to stay in arts and culture. They can't yeah. navigate to, let's say, human services. Or how do both of you gentlemen see that in, in relationship to being effective? John Tiso, let's start with you. Sure. Well, you know, I think that there's a measure of effectiveness in any role at any organization that is gonna to relate to, we'll say the hard skills, but there's also a personal role of effectiveness in any function that any of us holds at any job that are about us as individuals and not about the role that we're working within. And it's those traits and characteristics that make an effective leader able to operate successfully in any role anywhere regardless of what they may have prior experience with. Dr. John, that's an interesting thing because that doesn't, for some wackadoo reason, seem to be the prevailing thought, right? No, and I'm I'm going to make it worse because I'm built on what John Tiso is saying because another way of what John's saying is, is we believe that the more we can bring an individual out to really appreciate all their skills, all their values, their sense of meaning, their sense of purpose, their emotional expression, their deepest desires, that when all of that comes to work every day, we get we get more, more Julia, we get more John Tiso, we get more me, we get more of everyone. And when we have more of that in play, a lot of cool things happen. Now we're off script. Now we're just in the moment Mm -hmm. seeing what happens out of the ways we are with each other. Yeah, I can, I can see that. And I, I don't know. Um, I would ask you as well. It almost seems like that's a new behavior. Like we weren't really working in that direction. We were kind of like, leave your stuff at home. Yeah. Who you are, what you do, what your family environment, what your community is, what your beliefs are beliefs are show up and do the job. It seems to me like this is a whole new ecosystem of, of how we behave and, and dare I say, lead. Is that fair to say? Uh, absolutely. And some cultures embrace it and others don't. And, you know, we're in a, also a, a time of, you know, a, a political challenges, divisive uh, ways as a nation, as a world. Uh, and a lot of our work is helping people become self-aware, but also other aware, uh, because how you approach life and our organization together and how I do are probably very different. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be self-aware to know how we're approaching it and what kind of what are the, the rules or the beliefs we have about how things should be done. But but then I also need to find out how are you coming from that? Because until we're uh, we even have that exchange, we have two different cultures. We have my culture and we have your culture. Yeah, it looks like we're one culture, but we're really not. And okay. now extrapolate that out across an entire team at an organization. Right, right. And I have never heard any that that term other aware. I love it. I mean. That paints a picture that is an, an amazing. Um, I'm going to have to really think about that because I think that's a brilliant way to rethinking how we work. The other thing I want to ask both of you gentlemen about is how do we identify and nurture leadership? I think a lot of times um, this is this can be gender uh, biased and that women tend to be at wait to be asked and we will hear tap on the shoulder. You were tapped on the shoulder versus males a lot of time will be like, I want to leave, you know, call me up, put me in the game coach kind of mentality. And I'm wondering what you see there or if that's just old school thinking. Dr. John, I'll give the, I'll throw this to you first. Well, this is about getting to know people. Mm -hmm. And um, I do a lot of interviewing um, for my clients um, for uh, new hires. Um, mm -hmm because I am trained 
to find out things about people that uh, my clients are not trained in. And they're they're looking really for skill sets for their organizations and they're doing the right thing. I'm looking for something different. I'm looking for who is this person? Where are they developmentally as a leader? And what are the what are the themes of their development that they're going to bring to the new job if the if they get hired? And so that all of that's on the table uh, between an employer and a and a uh, employee uh, going into it. So it's not something we discover about each other, you know, 90 days into the relationship. Yeah, that would be problematic. John Tisa, what does this look like within your own organization? And how do you see this like functioning at JMT Consulting? Because this is a real thing that's probably going on every day, right? Yes, yes. And in fact, it, it's beyond every day, Julia. It's it's every moment with everybody. You know, we mentioned before that that, you know, leadership classically is considered a function of your title or your role or some authority that you're granted. And, you know, what John and I work on and support others to see is that leadership is is purely the ability to influence somebody and that every single person has the ability to be an influence on someone else. We are all leading all the time. And it's an entire mindset shift. You know, uh, for example, helping helping the members of my team who work with our clients directly see how they can lead other groups within JMT, even though they don't have any prescribed authority over them, has been an entire mentality shift that has allowed that one team to hold others to raise their game, so to speak. Everyone is a leader, and it's about how are we bringing ourselves fully into our our work every day to have that influence. So I've got to ask this question. How do you like how do you communicate that? Because for some people, this is going to be the first time they've ever heard that, right? Because yes. they're like, well, I'm not C-suite. How, what do I, I'm just a worker bee. How can I do that? How do you, you got to be telling this story over and over again. This isn't like a one and done thing, right? Correct. That is absolutely correct. You know, for all of us rewiring our our internal selves, you know, there's a, a, a concept of neuroplasticity. Rewiring ourselves takes a lot of time. And now Dr. John could go on about this, how for my own growth journey, uh, accepting and being okay with the time it takes to, to grow and change has mm -hmm. been part of my own journey. Um, but my continuous support and reminders for the team over time has helped them really solidify and internalize that, for example, when I tell them I'm going to support you, if you hold someone else to a higher standard, Right. That gives them the security to take that risk. And it's all about taking risks. Wow. Dr. John, as a leader, sometimes I would, if I thought my team was like, we're going to take a risk, I'd be like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You know, it can be like a little scary, right? Absolutely. Uh, but the risk taking, and um, I always like to say, you know, getting out of bed is the first risk we take every day. <laughs> right. And, and there are people who don't get out of bed. That's yeah. real. Um, but, the, you know, and, and I'm constantly all day long, like, you know, good job. You stood up. Good job. You got dressed. Good job. You made your to do list. You know, you know, I'm I'm just affirming every little thing I did that that seems like it should be procedural and, and all that. But sometimes these little things are are like moving me closer and closer to the next thing, the, the client meeting, the client presentation, the the research analysis, the you know, the work that it, that we we each need to do that can be kind of terrifying, you know. And so um it's taking these risks and being kind to ourselves in the risk taking. A, a big, big part, big thing theme uh, of my research that keeps people from actually developing more of themselves as leaders is this whole sense of being able to appreciate myself, self-appreciation and, and, and learning, you know, there's a lot, you hear a lot about self-compassion. Uh, that's self-love. Those are big words. And, uh, you know, I was taught, like, let's just break it down into the very smallest things we're doing moment by moment. And let's appreciate those things. 
You know, that's a great word because I, I think appreciation is, um, is scalable mm -hmm. where the other words seem to be a little bit more, um, you know, you're a hundred percent or you're zero percent. And so this, that appreciation can mean a lot of different things. Um, so I, re I, I like, I'm going to use that word. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, cause I hadn't really thought of it in, in those ways. You know, you're, you've given us a lot of really interesting insights and you both come at this from a different way. Let's have you both chat with us about culture. I mean, Dr. John, you said something really interesting about breaking it down, self-actualizing almost to saying, mm -hmm. I did this, I appreciate it. You know, you that self-talk, uh, my son-in-law has taught me this thing that I say now all the time, spiral up, think about yourself spiraling up as opposed Ooh, to spiraling nice. down. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I love that because for some reason in my mind, I can see that, you know, keep spiraling yeah. up, go up, go up, don't go down. How do we start this almost like in a cultural way where we, yep. we walk through the door or we jump onto Zoom or yep. we send an email and we're communicating these things? Well, two two things uh, to start with. Uh, one is what you, what you were just saying: the spiraling up instead of the spiraling down. Mm -hmm. That's that's a paradigm shift, mm -hmm. and I, and I have a lot of history with spiraling down. I spent a lot of my life going in that direction, sort of into the black hole, mm -hmm. and I and I and I learned to to stop that. I, it was something a a behavior I, I inherited from my dad. I went to school on him. That's how I learned to do it. But I had to unlearn it. So, so I had to replace it with, with, um, instead of going to the black hole, I needed to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the second thing I would say is, is a culture of continuous learning and growth comes out of celebrating anything and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so if you come to our daily staff meeting uh, every morning, the first thing everyone checks in and they ever, everyone celebrates everything we can from the day before client meetings, proposals, wins, losses. We celebrate the losses because we know the losses are part of getting to the next win. And uh, my wife and I, um, when we're out walking the dogs um, every morning and every evening, we have a little tradition. If anyone's cranky, which might happen on occasion <laughs> to one of us, <laughs> we, the other person has the right to say, drop and give me five. And that means uh, give me five celebrations. And, and what that does uh, is actually shifts our whole state of being when we start saying positive things about who we are and what we've been doing. I love that. I think I'm going to have to employ that in about 12 hours, 10 hours. <laughs> John Tiso, what are you all doing and, and what are you seeing and what are you learning from as you lead your teams um, I know you have a diverse workforce. They're uh, remote, um, yeah. started remote more than what, 25 years ago, right? 30. 30. 30. Okay, years pardon ago. me. That's that's revolutionary in itself, worth another conversation for a whole nother day. <laughs> but, but how do you do that when you don't have that proverbial water cooler that you can stand in front of and try and ramp somebody up? Yep. Yep. So certainly not having everyone together does present an extra uh, a limiter or a hurdle. Um, but I think for me, it's really centered on, and this is going to actually tie back to both of the examples that Dr. John provided. It's about the choices that I'm making. You know, every day I have a full calendar and I absolutely have more than enough justifiable reasons to choose to cancel that next meeting with someone but I instead choose not to. And through that, follow up on that meeting and then figure out whatever else on the back end. Okay. Uh, historically, I had made a lot of my decisions without really deciding myself. It was one of those classic, I already made the decision and then figured out why I did right. it. The, and that consciousness is where that pattern starts to break. And I have found that's where on my own growth journey and development of my leadership skills, that's where my linchpin of my growth was, was slowing down enough to be able to ask myself what's going on before I start making choices. And eventually that expands out where I can start nurturing others to do the same. Mm -hmm. 
I love that because that's incredibly self-aware and it's got to be, dare I say, a little scary because you're calling it yourself, is. you know, you're putting yourself in front of the classroom and saying, okay, this is what's going on, right? Yes. And here's where I made mistakes, where I could have been better. And that's a way that I lead by example too, is being, being as much me as I can, living into the vision that I hold for myself mm -hmm. and then simply being that way helps foster others to follow. Mm -hmm. I, I'm fascinated by this and, and we don't have much time. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say something that will probably be so offensive to so many people. But I feel like I have been talking with two females because I don't hear men having this conversation about leadership. I hear women saying it, but tragically, um, we don't have enough male leaders talking this way. And I think that the nonprofit sector has, you know, is skewed to females anyway. And we have a lot of women that, you know, go into uh, the sector. So I'm fascinated and I'm actually very hopeful about our sector when I hear this conversation, um, because it just bodes well for all of us, right? I mean, it it's just such a, um, it's, I almost want to use the word refreshing, but mean, it's more than that. It's meaningful. Um, I really have heard a lot from you and it makes me think that we got to be jumping into coaching and more mentoring. And yes. what does that look like to you? And, and let's start with John Tisa, like how obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but it seems to me that you've been a part of this journey and you've been getting this coaching and you've been getting this, you know, uh, yes. work done. And then you're e extending that, right. You're pushing. Correct. That. Correct. How, what is that arc like? Uh, well, before my, my growth path began, I, I kind of lived on my own. I would go out to find sources of guidance and absorb, and then would just keep it to myself and apply it where I wanted to use it. And that was the end. Uh, but through my work with Dr. John and, and others, you know, I, I've, I've come to realize you know, there's a lot more that I could be doing with that. And as I've clued into my purpose of improving the world and the lives of the people around me, that's really helped me align with that and act on it and start more proactively uh, providing that coaching and that mentoring and support to basically anybody that expresses a desire for it. Amazing. Dr. John, how willing and able are people coming to the table to begin this journey? Where you start and where you end, there's a big difference. People are people are at different places. Um, yeah. uh, one of the challenges we have is when someone's been told by a, a boss, you need coaching. Mm -hmm. And we have to kind of determine, are we working in a hostage situation? Because mm -hmm. if if we, if you, it's hard to be successful with someone who doesn't want anything. And, and one of the first things people work on in coaching is to actually want something to want, you know, uh, want a greater sense of belonging, to have a greater sense of personal agency, uh, to have a sense of uh, being seen more, being more influential. Uh, you know, as John talked about leadership at the beginning of the show about having the ability to influence the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of others. And so the more people want, um, the more effective the coaching uh, will be. You know, it's, it's interesting because I was talking about this with my husband and he said he, he had the most interesting concept of, or perspective. He's like, you would never be a professional athlete without having coach a lot of coaches from nutrition to, you know, psychology mm -hmm. to behaviors, everything. And for some, and, and then you, you know, you really are successful, right? But for some reason in the business world for, for profit and nonprofit, we don't think of that as a, as a strategic investment or option. It, it, do you see that changing, Dr. John? Do you see people being more open to this and wanting to make those investments? A absolutely. Um, and, and our model has been, it's been such a great journey and learning journey because as, as I've done my own getting coached, mm 
-hmm. and in and other training programs and experiential learning, mm -hmm. complementing the books I've read um, and the many papers I've written. <laughs> the um, the um, the sense that that we see in our clients is they see it working. Mm -hmm. And um, and the ones who really see it working the most are the clients where at the very senior level, they're doing the work themselves. Mm -hmm. they're, in their, they're in their own process of learning and growing. And I'm talking about very mature senior leaders who look like they're, they're essentially done. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they're good is because they are not, they don't hold themselves as done. There's more in them they want to keep developing. Right. And, you know, that's, as we wind up, that makes me think that if you have that perspective and that mindset, you can be a better leader about what we were talking about in the very beginning, cultivating that next group and identifying that next group. If you're, if you're thinking already about that, you're going to be able to make better choices, you know, that are sustainable for your leadership. Um, this has been amazing. I could talk to you two forever in a day. Um, and, and I think I'm going to get to, because I will be in Boston with both of you, um, in a couple of weeks, um, John Tiso, director of client services for JMT consulting. Talk to us about your big event that's coming up. Super gladly. Yes. Yeah. So JMT has an annual client conference called innovate. It's all about networking, all about training and education and learning. And we have a bunch of fun doing it all too. It is three days in Boston this year from May 1st through the 3rd. And all are welcome. Information is on our website. This is the event of the year. I'm telling you, I look forward to it every year. As soon as one ends, I'm ready for the next one. Well, I'm going to be there. Um, actually, we're going to have one day where we're broadcasting live um, from the convention floor. Um, an episode of the nonprofit show. And then I believe I'm going to be conducting a panel discussion in one of those days. And so um, Dr. John Davidoff, founder, chief mission officer, Davidoff mission driven business strategy. Will we see you there in Boston? You will. Uh, one of the things that all attendees get is they get a complimentary coaching session with uh, one of our uh, coaches from Davidoff strategy. You can have it at the conference, or you can schedule it before or after the conference, and it's it's part of the uh, enrollment uh, fee that JMT is offering. And John, what's the normal fee for that? Oh, it, it's a wide range um, that can can run several hundred dollars. Uh, hey, yeah. okay. Well, I put my name down. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up because that is amazing, and I I love the spirit of that because. You know, you don't know what you don't know. And and, yes. and until you can start to experience this, um, it's I just think it's mind opening. And uh, this has really been great. I love this discussion. We need to have you both on again, um, talking about more of these critical things. You know, 1.8 million nonprofits registered in America. And this has got to be in the top three discussions that nonprofits are having. Where do we go next with our leadership? They're aging out. They're exhausted. We've burned them out because of, you know, so many things going on in the last five years. And so, um, and plus it's tough work. It's tough work. And so this has been just amazing. Hey, another thing that's really amazing is our, our partners. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and Nonprofit Thought Leaders. Uh, these are the folks that join us day in and day out and really afford us these amazing conversations um, and, and it's really exciting. I so appreciate uh, both of you gentlemen coming on, being authentic, um, sharing your journey and, and being very um, open to being vulnerable and talking about what the challenges can be uh, because that's that's where so many of us are, right? And so this is really Absolutely. cool. Thank yeah. you, Julia. Pleasure to be with you. And you too, John. Same, same. Looking forward to the next time.
Yeah, well, we will see each other, all of us, in a couple of weeks in Boston. Go to jmtconsulting.com and you'll be able to learn more about the conference. You are not sold out yet, quite yet, right? Nope, we okay. still have openings. Okay, great. Well, hey, everybody, as we end every episode of the Nonprofit Show, we end with this mantra. And I, I'm telling you, it means something different to me every day that I say it. And today, it really is meaning something completely different. And that the message is today to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here for another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Thank you, gentlemen.